We continue our series from Book of First Peter, and we've come down to verse 10 to verse 12 today in First Peter chapter 1. And Peter really is con- concluding his main thought from the first uh, nine verses. And I title the sermon, So Great a Salvation. From these three verses, 10, 11, and 12, Peter, after sharing the reason to rejoice in our sufferings and looking forward to the future of seeing Jesus face to face, the Apostle Peter now gives an explanation of this salvation through four different identities, and we're going to look at them today. From this sermon, the salvation that is provided by you through Jesus Christ alone, by faith and grace, we know and have a complete, full understanding of that salvation today where those who have come before us didn't always understand completely the salvation that is provided for us through Jesus Christ. So I challenge you today, continue to grasp a better understanding of this great salvation that is ours. And if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior today, he died for your sins. And it's simply just confessing your sin, asking him forgiveness, and that he would come in and be Lord of your life. Understanding that Jesus alone, only Jesus, is the way, the truth, and the life. We can't reach God any other way but through Jesus Christ, Lord, Savior, Redeemer. Only him. No works. Nothing else. So let me read for you our text today, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. In the things that have now been announced to you, through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Somebody who just reads these three verses may say, what in the world? What does that have to do with me? What does that mean? Well, by the grace of God, I'm here today to share that with you. And I trust that by the Holy Spirit and through his word, you will gain understanding of these verses. The basis for the verses, these, this thought from Peter, is a simple little phrase at the, be, at the beginning of verse 10, concerning this salvation. The Greek word for concerning is peri, P-E-R-I, is the Greek word. And you know what that means. It means around, to surround, to get a complete look into and that's what Peter's saying here let's get a complete look into this salvation salvation the Greek word is soteriology the doctrine of salvation the full understanding of this salvation that is ours through Jesus Christ and the word this uh is modifying the noun, giving emphasis and and intensifying the thought. So Peter's saying, let's look a little bit deeper into this salvation. And the Apostle Peter is addressing those dispersed believers. If you go back up to verse 1 or 2, he talks about who he is writing to. And it's the dispersed believers that have been chased out of their homeland for believing in Jesus Christ, for being his followers. So he writes this text to encourage them. You know, you haven't been, I'm going to assume you haven't been chased out of your home or uh, out of your country. But these people were. And he's writing them to say, hey, Get the big picture. I want to encourage you. And he's writing about this great salvation 
that is ours. Just look at the things from the first nine verses that he says about this salvation. He calls them elect exiles. And friend, we just sang it. You are chosen. If you know Christ as your Savior, He called you. He redeemed you. It was nothing of your own. He brought you to Christ. And we're forever grateful. And then he says you're born again to a living hope. It's not a, not a maybe so. It's a definite hope that is alive, which is Jesus Christ. And then he says you have an, inher- an inheritance in this salvation. It's imperishable. It's undefiled. It's reserved in heaven. Verse 4. What a wonderful thought and truth. Nobody's taken it from you, for it's guarded. Verse 5. Guarded. It's secure. And verse 5, it's to be revealed in the last time. We're just in the process of this salvation. Glorification is coming. And I can't wait. How about you? I can't wait. Oh, get me out of here. (laughs) I'm ready. Heaven. Heaven. Presence of Jesus. Perfection. Savior. Let's go. Ready to load the bus? (laughs) I'll have it out this afternoon. It's a good thing it's not dependent on me, right? It is on Him and His perfect timing. Verse 7. Here's the result of your salvation. Results in praise, glory, and honor when he reveals himself. Verse 8, it's obtained through faith. You hear me say that all the time. It's only Jesus, Jesus only. By faith, I believe what he says. And it's written in this book. We take nothing other than what is in the book. And we believe that book. His word. That's faith. And then verse 9, it produces an enormous love for the one who saved us. Oh, he deserves all the praise, all the thanks. He's the only one who can rescue you from an eternal hell, from all the grief and strife and turmoil. Only Jesus, Jesus only. So, what do these three verses then teach us? He, he gives us these great thoughts about salvation, and then he says, concerning this salvation. So, what's Peter saying? I want you to see first, the prophets were inquisitive. Verse 10, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. I often talk about the fulfilled prophecies of Scripture. Old Testament prophets wrote by the leading of the Holy Spirit, their books and their recordings today are known as the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. Remember the Old Testament people did not have the Holy Spirit indwell them like we do as believers today in the New Covenant. So the Holy Spirit would come upon a person for a specific purpose, a specific task, and then he would leave. And they would accomplish that task while the Holy Spirit was on them. So Moses, Abraham, all of them for that time, but they, he didn't stay in and dwell with them. Now these men were inspired and led to write their life experiences. For example, Moses wrote about the Exodus. He shared firsthand about God freeing him and the Israelites from Egyptian slavery. And he could write that led by the Holy Spirit. Here's what happened. Here's the plague of frogs that came. He experienced it. So he wrote that for us. And theologically, it's called inspiration. It's a different meaning than our culture today. Inspiration means God breathed. God breathed his word, and these men, through their own personalities, wrote down what God was breathing out. So we have today 
and have confidence today that we have the Word of God, the words God wants us to have. Two examples of this, Moses wrote, which I gave you, he wrote his first-hand experience. But he also wrote the Pentateuch. He lived hundreds of years before Abraham. The Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible. A good estimate of belief is that Abraham died in 1991 B.C. And you can go to Genesis 25-7 for his death. Moses was born in 1526 B.C. You can go to Exodus chapter 2 for that. You're roughly four to five hundred years in between Abraham and Moses. Okay, you with me? You tracking? Okay. Moses wrote everything we know about Abraham, which is the Pentateuch, and in the book of Genesis even though he lived four to five hundred years after Abraham. Was it just through hearsay? No. The Holy Spirit led Moses in his writings that we accurately have what happened in Abraham's life. Same with Adam and Eve. Creation. And Esau, Jacob, all of them. We know because God used these prophets to write down the scripture, looking back and experiencing per firsthand what they knew, and the Holy Spirit led them for us to have the Word of God today. Then you have prophets like Micah, Isaiah, Daniel that wrote led by the Holy Spirit, about things that would be future. That they didn't understand completely. And here's a first-hand example. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah wrote this. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. He's writing this about Jesus Christ who would die on a cross. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With his wounds we are healed. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And it's a perfect description of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, who willingly gave himself. He didn't fight, he was our sheep, our, sh our lamb, the lamb of God who died for us. Well, how in the world, 700 years before it ever happened, could, Mo, could Isaiah write these words for us? These prophets were led by the Holy Spirit, inspired by God, as God breathed out his words that we might have the Word of God today. So this salvation, Peter says to the dispersed believers, he says, these guys, they wrote it down from God, but they would study it, they inquired about it, they had inquisitive minds concerning the salvation because they couldn't fully comprehend it. We look back today, hundreds and hundreds of years later, thousands of years later, and we're astounded at the prophets who so precisely wrote about our Savior and this salvation. And Peter's saying to those who were suffering and were dispersed, hey, be encouraged. Be encouraged. 
because you have this great salvation that even the prophets did not fully understand. Number two, verse 11, the Spirit was leading. The prophets were inquisitive, the Spirit was leading. Verse 11, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ in the subsequent glory. And in their writings, the prophets, as we mentioned, were cognizant of the Holy Spirit leading and directing them in the transcription of the scriptures. The word indicating there means to make clear. They were asking to the Holy Spirit, I wrote this, but I don't understand it. Make it clear. What, what does this mean? And they're inquiring. The word time is kairos, meaning for this season. And in this opportunity, what is going to happen? Now notice they didn't question it like the world does today. It wasn't questioned in unbelief. They believed it. They just wanted to know what? More details. Tell us about it. What's it mean? Make it clear to us. And you're going to read in the next section, it was not for their sake, it was for you, Peter says to the dispersed believers. And I say t it's for you today that you have complete understanding of the Word of God. So to encourage the dispersed believers, Peter brings them around to the working of the Holy Spirit. Not only the prophets, but the Holy Spirit. And this great salvation that we have, hundreds of years prior, the Holy Spirit was working and leading the prophets of God to write down what we fully understand as salvation today. And then he's mentioned again in the next section, which we have the apostles were preaching. The prophets were inquisitive, the Spirit was leading, the apostles were preaching. Look at verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you. So Peter's saying the Holy Spirit revealed to the prophets they weren't writing this for themselves. They were writing it for you, the believers, to come. But in you... But you, in the things that now have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Who was that? That was the apostles. The apostles of Jesus Christ. And linked with the prophets of the Old Testament are the apostles of the New Testament. Because who wrote us, who wrote down, led by the Holy Spirit, the words of God in the New Covenant? John, Matthew, Luke, right? These apostles wrote the word of God for us today that we have known as the New Testament. Now look at this phrase, they were serving you in the things that now have been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you. The apostles were the Christ-called eyewitnesses to the ministry of Jesus where the ones who knew the Old Testament, they knew it well, and they were able to share in the life of Jesus Christ here on earth. And the Lord ascends back to heaven, Acts chapter 2, Pentecost happens, the Holy Spirit comes down, fills these apostles and they're bold now they go out and begin to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and these dispersed believers heard it through the apostles what a great truth note this the same Holy Spirit who was used to lead the prophets to write the Old Testament is the same Holy Spirit, the same God who empowered the apostles of the New Testament. And this is the same Holy Spirit who lives within 
you as a believer and follower of Jesus Christ. He lives within us as he did the apostles in that day. Do you get the progression, the links together? God spoke by the Holy Spirit to various prophets such as Samuel, Daniel, Zechariah, Micah, Zephaniah. God used them to write that Jesus, deity, was going to come from heaven to earth. And this would bring the Savior to earth who would die. And they wrote all this down. And then the apostles who walked with Jesus here on earth saw him die a cruel death. But they also were eyewitnesses and gave testimony to the resurrection of the dead. For he came out of the tomb. And then at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they were able to share and spread the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he empowered them. That's this great salvation that we know and we own today. And the Apostle Peter tells the dispersed believers, your suffering is well worth it. Take heart. God has done this work and you are a recipient of the great salvation that the Apostles preached. And we see the Holy Spirit inspired the Scriptures, He empowered the Apostles, and he presides in every believer. Thank God. Thank God for the prophets of old, for the Holy Spirit's work, and for the apostles who lived and proclaimed the eyewitness truth of Jesus Christ. And we get to read about it and know it today. But there's one last thing, number four, the prophets were inquisitive, the Spirit was leading, the apostles were preaching, and the angels are in wonder. This is special. This is an amazing concept to ponder. And Peter closes with this thought about the angels. For he says, the end of verse 12, things, that is the salvation, all that is inclusive about salvation into which angels long to look. <laughs> How sweet is that? You own, I'm going to get into it a little more, you own and possess something that the angels desire and long to know more. What a great truth. Now there's a lot of misconceptions, misteaching about angels today. I want to share with you on the screen, I'm not going to go into them, but I'm going to give them to you, 10 things that the angels of God do, have done, and will do. It's small, but I'll just highlight a few. The angels exist to glorify God. Job 38, Psalm 148, Isaiah 6, Luke 2, Hebrews 1, Revelation 5, Revelation 7. They exist solely to bring glory to God Almighty. They were involved in the, in the announcement of the birth of Christ. <clears throat> they ministered to Jesus. <clears throat> they uh, were present at the grave site. Today, they celebrate and rejoice every time a sinner receives Christ as their Savior. They're around the throne of God. There's ten things there with scripture reference for everything that angels do and are involved in and will do. But I bring you back <clears throat> to our text. Things into which angels long to look. Angels are created beings. They do not have a soul and a will. The fallen angels are fallen the holy angels are holy forever. The word things <clears throat> represents the many aspects of our salvation. 
And that includes all that we shared with you about the Old Testament prophets, everything about Jesus as being uh, pre-existent, part of creation, and then leaving heaven, God choosing his son to come out of love for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. To the thought about Jesus taking on flesh and Jesus the son of God suffering for those who do not deserve anything. How a sinner, a lawbreaker, a violator like us can be redeemed. The apostles suddenly becoming bold to proclaim this good news of salvation and how salvation is a free gift. All of that is represented in the word things. It's all inclusive of everything that involves our salvation. And knowing these and many more things about salvation, the angels long, it says, the word has to do with an overpowering influence, a strong impulse, a longing. It's not just a whimsical wonder. Oh, look at that. No, that's not what it, it's saying. It's saying they have a strong, overpowering impulse to know more about this salvation. An incredible passion that they cannot experience. And then the word look means to gaze with, by stretching out your head. It's the same root Greek root word that when John ran to the tomb after hearing about the resurrection, that same word is he looked or peered into the tomb to see if the body was there. That's the same word here. Stretch out your head to make note, to see. To, to understand, to gaze into. And the angels are fascinated to no end at what you as a believer in Jesus Christ have. That's sweet. The angels marvel at the salvation you own in receiving Christ as your Redeemer. What a concept. What a great truth. So the prophets were inquisitive, the spirit was leading, the apostles were preaching, and the angels were in wonder. In conclusion, verse 1 to 12, Peter is addressing those who are suffering, those who are discouraged by being shipped out of their country, their homeland, for being a believer, a disciple of Christ. And his conclusion in these first 12 verses of the book of 1 Peter is this. They have this great salvation. These dispersed believers have a great salvation. And although they are going through various sufferings, it cannot compare to the riches and the glory of their hope and salvation in Jesus Christ. Last August, as a pilot of an American Airlines flight was approaching LAX, he radioed the tower, Tower American 1997. We just passed a guy on a jetpack. This pilot radioed to the tower. Another flight came on and said, we just saw the guy pass by us on a jetpack. Here's a man 3,000 feet in the air with a pack on his back flying around L.A. airport and these monstrous airlines, airplanes, are flying right around him. Some people are crazy. <laughs> but... As amazing as that story is, that cannot compare to the story of your salvation. Here's what Jesus did for us. He left the splendors of heaven. He took on flesh. 
He didn't have to do that. He's God. He was sinless. He lived a sinless life. We sin every day through omission or commission. And he took all your sin, all my sin, paid for it with his precious blood. And our sin is covered by him. When we receive the gift, the free gift of salvation. That's why we say, oh, it's only Jesus and Jesus only. It's the only way to reach heaven. Completely trusting in him, asking him to forgive us of our sin and receiving that free gift. And knowing where our world is right now, you may in coming days personally need to rely on these same truths to get you through. It's not out of the realm of possibility as a believer to be reminded and encouraged that, hey, it's been the work of the Holy Spirit from the prophets to the apostles to us today. And we have this spirit that lives within us. And he will finish the job. He will get us home. There's no doubt about it. And I remind you, you have far more knowledge of salvation through Jesus Christ than the Old Testament prophets ever knew. You have what the apostles of Jesus Christ knew firsthand and proclaimed. You have experienced the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Deity indwells you. And on top of that, angels long to know more about this salvation that God has done for us. Those of us who have believed and received Jesus Christ. We close with this final triumphant praise. And I want you to note that the angels are joining in with those who are redeemed in this future scene. Let's read together Revelation 7, verse 9 to 12, as a conclusion to this sermon. In understanding one day, we are in this throng. Let's read together. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Can't wait. Can't wait. We will be part of that great multitude of people in white robes vowing, praising, giving glory to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for you, the truth of your word. Thank you that you have one great big plan. It's called the Kingdom of God. And you're building it. And it began with the prophets of old, the apostles, all through the Holy Spirit to those believers who were dispersed to us today, who have the Holy Spirit living within them. Oh, so great a salvation we have. Thank you so much for loving us for coming to earth to save us. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen.